Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming out and joining us once again as we continue our series on Bible prophecy. In particular, looking at Bible prophecies that show to us that God really does exist. And to lead us in tonight's discussion, we have uh, Shem, and he's going to be looking at both uh, Egypt and Israel. But to start our night, we'll open with a word of prayer, if you'll stand. O oh Lord, our great and our mighty God, we come before you to thank you for tonight that we can share together, that we can share together around your word, your word of hope and of promise and of good news, a word that can show us what is happening in the world around us, a word that can provide comfort and can show to us that you really do exist. And beyond this, a word that shows to us that you desire to work with us, that you have a plan and purpose with this earth and you want us to be a part of it. So please be with all that we do tonight, that the things that we look at and the things that we discuss may help us to build our faith that you do exist and that you will reward those who seek you. Please be with our speaker tonight that the things that he says will be an accurate representation of your word and that will help to build our courage to look at the world around us. So we leave our night in your care, in your son's name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I did see Dave Luke before. He is here. Good. Uh, as an introduction to our talk tonight, we'll take a reading from Ezekiel 36, verses 8 to 15, and Dave Luke will read that for us. So, Ezekiel 36, verse 8 to 15. But ye, O mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches and yield, for, yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. For behold, I am for you, and I will return unto you, and ye shall be tilted and sown. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it. And the cities shall be inhabited, and the wastes shall be builded. And I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase the, and bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estates, and will do better unto you than at your beginnings. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Yea, I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess thee, and thou shalt be their inheritance, and thou shalt no more henceforth bereave them of men. Thus saith the Lord God, because they say unto you, Thou, thou land devourest up men, and hast bereaved thy nations. Therefore shall Therefore thou shalt devour men no more, neither bereave any thy nations any more, saith the Lord God. Neither will I cause men to hear in thee the shame of the heathen any more, neither shalt thou bear the reproach of the people any more, neither shalt thou cause thy nations to fall any more, saith the Lord God. Thanks, uh, Dave. Now I invite your close attention to Shem as he addresses the topic Bible prophecy evidence that God exists. Thanks, Shem. Well, thank you, James, and also uh, welcome everyone to tonight. And thanks also to James for filling in last week and doing the whole lot. Uh, so, as James covered last week, and as, as the beginning of our two-part series, looking at the evidence from Scripture that God exists by looking at some prophecies or things that would that the Bible said would take place, and they they indeed did take place. 
So James finished last week with a quote that we have as Isaiah 46, verse 9 through to 11, where it says there, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. What, have I, what I have planned, that I will do. And so there, God is telling it through Isaiah the prophet, he's telling anyone that's willing to, to read that and listen, that God is in control of everything, isn't he? He's the one that has set out his plan and his purpose, and those things uh, will take place. And we'll have a look at uh, later on another quote very similar that talks about uh, waiting for uh, the will of God to take place. So in the middle there we have... Uh, Prophecy, these prophecies, these words that God has set out show that he exists in that there can only be a being that is much greater than anything that we can do uh, that has actually written and given these words that we call the Bible today. And God has shown to anyone, as we said, just said, anyone that's willing to read and listen to them, his plan and purpose, what he has in store for this earth. So it just takes us a bit of time to dig into them and have a look. Now, one of my favourite verses there at the bottom is Daniel 4, where God shows Nebuchadnezzar, who he thought, uh, Nebuchadnezzar himself, thought he was the greatest man, if not uh, a god on earth. He thought he, he could do anything, and God was able to make him as low as an animal. And it says there, Till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomsoever he will. So God is able to give the kingdom of Babylon, as we saw last week, to whoever he, he desires. And we saw there with Persia come through in one night was able to take that, uh, that city and that empire, which if you think about that situation, it's almost, if you wrote that in a story, a fictional story, people would say it's unbelievable that an empire like Babylon would fall in one night. And yet that's what God said would happen and that's what uh, did happen. And then in verse 35 of Daniel 4, it goes on and says, that God doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. So it's all according to the will of God. So hopefully we, over the last week and this week, we're able to see that God is in control of what's taking place. And another quote uh, that is, is very mindful for each of us to remember, Amos 3 verse 7, Surely God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So particularly the prophets we're looking at is Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and God has revealed his secrets to them so that people may hear what he has in store. So firstly, tonight we're going to look at Egypt. We're going to also look at Israel, and there's a bit of pretty good comparison between the two nations. So last week we looked at nations that were destroyed or came to an end, and this week we're looking at nations that, in the case of Egypt, would become a base nation, and yet they still exist. And also uh, we're going to look at Israel as well, who once again exist back in their land. And in many ways, Egypt is actually a fascinating nation to look at if you look back at history. I think almost every person on this earth would know something about ancient Egypt. It uh, has permeated through all uh, walks of life, as in some form of knowledge of them. Um, Almost they are beyond imagination with the, the massive pyramids, the things that they built, with uh, the hieroglyphs that they've left on, uh, on the walls and also on paper, and uh, the temples, all these things that the ancient Egyptians were, were built and known for uh, is actually in some ways magnificent from a human point of view. And so I'm sure most of us know something about the ancient civilization. But they were one of knowledge. They had philosophy and they had great power at that time. And through scripture, through the word of God, that is actually a symbol of, of man's power that they were, uh, had. And he, if you know anything of the exodus of, of the Israelites out of Egypt, it was them leaving that uh, philosophy and thoughts behind. So I have on the screen there just a couple of the things you no doubt have seen or seen pictures of. Um, so we have there on the very left the, the Great Sphinx. Everything seems to have the word great attached to it. We have the uh, Pyramids of Giza. And also there we have the, the Golden Death Mask, as it's called, of Tutankhamun. And that's a, a two pieces of 
of gold, which weighs about two kil um, 10 kilograms. There's like two layers of gold overlaid each other. And we know the mummification process and all the, the mummies and things that they had. And it's, it's quite amazing from a humanistic point of view to look at that uh, power of man. And yet today, if we look at Egypt and think that is just ancient history now, isn't it? Uh, they certainly don't show that sort of glory today. So a couple of uh, just basic points of, of Egypt in the ancient history. We don't need to go really into it, but they sort of have three main periods of time, then a fourth sort of tacked on the end, which is, uh, as you can see there, the, the three periods of time. And the, the fourth one there, which is what they call the late New Kingdom, is actually the period of time with the kings of Judah and Israel uh, that we'll have a quick look at tonight as well. So they fit into that period. So even by the time that the kings of Israel are on their thrones the glory of Egypt was, was fading uh, quite uh, quickly, especially the, the ancient glory that they had. The pharaohs, and as many kings in the ancient times, considered themselves as gods, and that gave them a level of power over the people because you're less likely to overthrow a god as a king if you don't like him as your ruler. Um, whereas if you just realise he's a, another man, then you, you can rise up against him. Now we point out there about the Nile. The Nile is one of the key points on, of Egypt and why it was so powerful. Uh, because the Nile, especially as it floods out into the delta, uh, can produce a massive amount of food. So if you can feed your people and you can sell a huge abundance of food to the other nations, well straight away you have a lot of money coming in, a lot of gold, and that gives you a lot of power. So it's, uh, I think it, it's the longest river off the top of my head, but it's... Uh, 6,700 kilometres of, of water flow. And Ramses II, you no doubt have heard of. He's probably one of the ones uh, that has built some of the biggest of the monuments. Um, he was the last of the most powerful of those, um, those kings. So the period that we're looking at of Babylon and uh, Israel and Judah and then Persia is that, that late New Kingdom on the Egypt's point of view. But this is the period of uh, the prophets of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, and Isaiah as well, sorry, uh, from about that 630 BC uh, onwards down to uh, 390, etc. So here's just some of, the, some of the tombs and things that they built. This here is uh, the temple for, what is it called there? The small temple of Hathor. Um, so the great temple of Ramses, the next one is the small temple. So there are actually four images of Ramses. So one image of himself wasn't enough, he had to do four of them. So the little tiny ones in between the legs and everything is, um, I think one of them in the middle is his one of his wives and some of the other ones are, are children and um, things like that. But I'm not sure why he'd have to build four uh, statues of himself. But this mountain has actually been moved from where it originally was, um, which is a bit of an engineering feat in itself. So this is just around the corner from that one. There's another, the small temple of Hathor. And it's a fair bit smaller than the other one. You can see the people there walking into the front of it. So these are pretty glorious, aren't they? When you think about man or humans were um, instrumental in building these things as, as reminders to that uh, ancient glory. And here we have the Nile, as we mentioned, uh, flowing out into that green sort of triangular area at the top, that delta, which is where they're able to produce a massive amount of food. Um, and so if you think fast forwarding to the Roman times, they too came through and took, Rome, uh, took Egypt because one of the big reasons was the ability to feed their empire. You think the comparison of this uh, Nile to the Italian peninsula and you're trying to feed your empire. Uh, this is why Egypt is, was so um, pivotal to a lot of these empires coming and taking them uh, because they could produce so much food. And if you think of the time of Joseph when he was in Egypt, uh, the, the pharaoh at the time became very powerful because they were able to produce a massive amount of food and then store it and sell it when uh, the god um, promised uh, the, um, the drought would come and there wouldn't be food for people, so they would have to come to Egypt. So it's a good example of uh, the ability that they had. So the river itself flows from uh, the Sudanese mountains um, south of Egypt. So it comes a long way down uh, through to the Mediterranean. 
So if we have a look at a couple of Bible quotes about Egypt. So Egypt was, as we said, magnificent in, from a human point of view. It has these ancient history, uh, and yet what does the Bible say? And probably the most popular one about the future of Egypt at the time was Ezekiel 29. And there it says, And they shall be there a base kingdom, and they shall be the basest of kingdoms. It says, they shall, Neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, and no more rule the nations. It shall, no more, shall be no more the confident of the house of Israel. So for one, the nation of Egypt would no longer be like they were in the past, this glorious kingdom uh, or empire almost. Uh, they would become basis. And not only that, they would not rule other nations anymore. And particularly to Israel, they would, Israel would no longer be able to put their confidence in them at all. Now, this was told to Ezekiel during the time when the Assyrians were growing in their power. So Egypt was still a very powerful nation, and they had actually come up uh, right the way up to Syria. And they were fighting, they even fought, as I'll show on a map in a moment, against Israel, uh, but they had come all the way up um, into Syria. So they were a long way for their homeland of Egypt at that time when they were told, or well, this prophecy was given to Ezekiel, that they would become a base nation. So if you think about uh, a nation is, is out of its borders, it's spreading, it's trying to promote itself and become more powerful, and it's fighting with Assyria, who actually takes over the Egyptian power, and sets up the kings within it. So Syria was on its increase when this was being told. And if you think from the point of view of the Israelites living at that time, and that's where who Ezekiel was talking to, saying, don't worry about Egypt, they will become a base nation. So in some ways I like to look at the Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel as the watchmen of the time. They're watching what's happening, but they're able to actually ask God questions and say, when is this happening? Why is this happening? And so this is why God told Ezekiel to, don't worry about Egypt, they will become a base nation. And the other two quotes there uh, reference to what actually happens to Egypt once Babylon uh, takes uh, the power from Syria. So Jeremiah 46 talks about, against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which is by the river Euphrates, so that's all the way up, a long way up, isn't it, into where Turkey is today in Carchemish, which Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, smote. So he destroyed them there, and they fled back down to Egypt. And the other reference there is 2 uh, Kings 24, verse 7. The king of Egypt came not again any more out of his land, for the king of Babylon had taken from the brook of Egypt unto the river Euphrates. So now that the Babylonian empire uh, was able to push him back into his land, and he didn't uh, want to come back out of there. And there's a good book called Egypt, uh, by W. H. Bolton, and he writes in there on page 141, he says, One thing is certain, Egypt had come to the end of its history as a power. Henceforth it was to exist as a base kingdom as the prophet Ezekiel had foretold. So from there, there on they had moments or glimpses of trying to become greater, but they would never uh, become like they used to be. So on the screen there we have uh, Josiah, who, uh, the map of Israel, where Josiah... Uh, tried to fight against uh, Pharaoh Necho, and unfortunately he was killed in that battle. And we see uh, down at the bottom left where Egypt had gone all the way up to Carchemish on the very top right, and that's where they were defeated by the Babylonians. And as Ezekiel was told not to rely on the Egyptians, uh, unfortunately some of the uh, Ju Judah and Israeli uh, kings did, in particular one that comes to mind is Zedekiah. And he was told... Uh, you are trusting in Egypt that broken reed of a staff which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. That's Isaiah 36 verse 6. So Zedekiah wasn't listening to the prophets at that time and he was trying to turn to Egypt for support and unfortunately they didn't come and help him. Uh, exactly what was told. So that's a rough example of, a very quick example of Egypt from a massive nation, a massive empire, a glorious empire. We can only look and marvel at their history and to see a biblical quote by God saying that they would become a base nation. But they still exist, don't they? The last week we looked at nations that were completely wiped out, covered by sands of time, whereas Egypt is still there. It's actually one of the most travelled destinations in the world because of those ancient artefacts. So how is it going? 
So this is just a bit of uh, economical information. I'm certainly not a, an economist, but uh, here's just some basic information on, on how the country is today. So GDP is the, the gross domestic productivity. That's a pretty big number, 363 billion. And to me, when I saw that, I thought, well, they're doing pretty good. But the per capita is only 3,500. So the per capita is roughly how much people earn. So they're about $3,500 $3 a year. So if we compare that with Australia, uh, we don't have 100 million people, obviously. We have, what, 30 million. Australian GDP is 1.3 trillion. So that's a massive difference to a nation of 100 million. And our per capita is about 51,000. So there's 3,500. So that's a significant difference of Australia to Egypt. So you'd say, uh, quite plainly, that Egypt is actually a very poor country in general. Uh, some of the questions I've asked there, what's their biggest company? So one of the biggest companies uh, in Egypt is the, the Telecom Egypt. So that's the phone system. And that's worth 3.6 billion. And compared to Telstra here in Australia, that's worth 15 billion. So you can see um, the Australian Telstra is worth a lot more. The bank in Egypt is worth a lot of money, um, about half of what uh, Combank is worth. So you can see that while these are big numbers, Australia is a very wealthy country in comparison, and Egypt is not. Now, one interesting um, is how much do, does a country spend on R&D? So R&D is research and development. So what are they spending on technology? And theirs is actually quite high compared to all the countries around them except Israel. So there's 0.7% of the GDP spent on looking at new technology. Um, so that's actually a very low number in general. It means you're not actually progressing your population forward in, in future technologies. Uh, Israel's is about 4 or something percent we'll see in a few moments. Um, just on the GDP per capita, if we compare it to another Arabic nation nearby, Qatar, theirs is uh, 50,000 as well. So Egypt is way behind even on nations that are nearby. So having a look at some uh, websites, nation, uh, Nations Encyclopedia, so that looks at all the nations. Um, as you can see on the screen there, it says living standards in Egypt are low by international standards and have declined consistently since 1990. So 20 to 30% of the population live below the poverty line. That's a pretty high percent that are living uh, very poorly and struggling to feed themselves. And this bottom quote there is 32 million people below the national income poverty line in 2018. So that's that 30 odd percent live. So that's a massive number. That's all of Australia living below the poverty line in this country. Uh, the average weekly wage in Egypt is about $92. So if you compare that with what the average Australian would, would earn. And so we can see, I think, in a real quick nutshell, that Egypt is a poor nation. It's not really leading the world in any one particular area. Uh, one of its biggest um, exports is oil. Uh, and yet, even though the other oil countries around it produce far more and are able to uh, make the most out of what they earn from that. But some of the other things that they're, uh, their biggest exports are textiles and things like that which no doubt don't earn them actually a lot of money uh, for the people doing the work. So hopefully from that you've been able to see uh, from words that God gave Ezekiel that the ancient nation of Egypt is now uh, quite a poor base nation in the world. So now we'll have a look at, at Israel and the chapter that we read tonight. It was a fantastic uh, chapter on what Israel would be like in the future, and it has even future uh, context to our time yet. But the very fact that Israel even exists in the land, I think, is, is astronomical, really. It's an amazing miracle that they are back in their land and not just in the world somewhere as people that we may know as Jews, but they are back in their homeland. And in comparison to Egypt, uh, Egypt is still there in their land. Israel was scattered throughout the nations, and they, would be, they were told that they would be brought back to their homeland. And that chapter we read tonight talked about the, the mountains of Israel would have their people back on them. And we'll have a, a look at that in a bit, bit of detail in a few moments. One of the things that always strikes me with these prophecies is the detail in them about what will happen. So with Babylon, with uh, 
Tyre last week. It's not just that empire will come to an end at some point in the future. Like a random guess is very detailed about what would take place. And so we can see Egypt are there, but they're a base nation. Israel was scattered, they were returned, and there's a number of detail we'll look at which they are fulfilling in our, our very own eyes. And I think to me that's one of the little things that really shows that God does exist uh, because of the detail that's found in there. So going back right back to when Israel had left Egypt, uh, there's a couple of warnings that God gave them through Moses. So Deuteronomy 4 and 28, it's warning that God says, if you will corrupt yourself, then I will punish you, I will scatter you. And so chapter 4, verses um, 25 through to 31, uh, says that the Lord will scatter you among the peoples. In the latter days, you will return. So even though he was promising that if they did the wrong, he would punish them, he still says there that I will return you. And verse 31, because God is merciful, he will not abandon you or destroy you or forget his covenant with your forefathers. So it's instrumental, isn't it, in the people of Israel being back in their land because God made a promise to their forefathers. And that's a subject we deal with uh, quite regularly here on the Sunday night. And again, in uh, Deuteronomy 28, more warnings if they didn't obey God, the, uh, that the Lord would scatter them among the nations from one end of the earth to the other. So when they were taken by Assyria and Babylon, I wouldn't say they were scattered among the nations from one end of the earth to the other. They were in neighbouring nations and they were brought back. Whereas in the latter time, it was definitely scattered throughout the world. And from verse 65 to 68, it says that they, in those times of scattering, they would have no rest. They would be trembling of heart, failing of eyes, there would be anguish of soul, and basically they would not have an assurance of life. They would always be watching for what's happening to them. And that's definitely an example of uh, the Israeli history from about AD, uh, AD 70. So one of the things, though, is this was given to them as they came out of Egypt when God was trying to get them to leave that thinking of the world, the power of man, behind and to follow his ways. And that's what he was trying to lift them to develop. In Jeremiah 30, it says there, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I'll bring my people back. So they were scattered. They were scattered during the times of um, these prophets and also later on, as we just said in AD 70, that God promised that they would be brought back. And again, it says here, uh, to the land I gave their forefathers. And in this chapter here, it talks about that they would no longer be a slave to anyone else. They would no longer be required to do something for someone. They would be uh, able to follow their own destiny to a degree. It says their yoke would be broken and no longer slaves. So they're not in another country having to follow their rules. Um, as we see Israel back in their own land today and doing uh, pretty much what they please. It says there in verse 10, I'll save out of a distant place your descendants from the land of exile. They'll be in rest, they'll be quiet, and they won't be afraid. And that's definitely, if you look at Israel today, they are very confident, even though it may not be particularly a place of peace, if we look at the uh, missiles and things like that, it's definitely a level of confidence that they live there today. In Jeremiah 16, verses 14 to 16, is one of the ways that God would work in the nations to bring them back to that land. If we think of World War I and World War II, how they were forced to go back to the land. And it actually really started back in the late 1800s uh, with what's known as the Aliyah, which is the, the Jews heading home to Israel. Even before the nation of Israel existed there again, uh, they were, were fishermen. What does a fisherman do? He lures a fish to his hook. And so to me, I love that uh, little phrase there. He's, he's almost drawing them in, but because they weren't moving there, then the hunters would hunt them, and so they would flee and, and try and escape there. So there's a great little uh, couple of verses there. And Ezekiel 20 and also says that about bringing them back from the nations... And if Ezekiel 28 as well, they will know that I am the Lord when I gather the people of Israel. And it specifically says some things that we read tonight in 36. They will live in safety, they will build, they will plant and they will dwell with, with confidence. And that's how they um, are today.
So if you come across to Ezekiel 36, if you're hopefully still there, we don't need to go through all the verses that are listed on the screen, but there's a couple of little words we just want to really show, and you hopefully you'll see that that reflects what they're doing today. So we only read a little section of it tonight, but pretty much the whole chapter is very relevant uh, to them coming back to the land. So we have in uh, verse 8, so this is actually a prophecy to the mountains of Israel. So the you here is actually the mountains of Israel, that they'll have the people of Israel back on there. So I've just got an NIV in front of me, but uh, the words are much the same. It says, But you, O mountains of Israel, will produce branches and fruit of my people Israel, for they will soon come home. So you may recall after World War II, there was a lot of talk about Israel having a nation, and there was talk about all sorts of places throughout the world. Uh, Africa, or South Africa, um, Africa, um, even Tasmania, there was talk about putting them in Tasmania and many different parts of the world, and yet they ended up in their homeland and no other place in the world. That's exactly where God said they would be. But uh, one that was quite interesting in this verse 9, in this translation it says, you will be ploughed and sown to the mountains, um, which talks about agricultural work being happening in, in the mountain areas, but has the idea of the, the Jews, when they're in the land, will start growing food. And we definitely see that in the, in the country today. It goes on in verse 11 that I will increase the number of men and animals upon you. They will be fruitful and become numerous. I will settle people on you as in the past and make you prosper more than before. Uh, if we jump down to verse 12, my people of Israel to walk upon you. They will possess you and you will be their inheritance. So we've got talk there of, of a lot of animals being back in that land and them settling in areas. And we actually see that in the headlines occasionally about these settlers in places where, according to the, the world legalities, Israel shouldn't be putting settlements. And we see that happening a lot. And this is exactly the terminology that's used here about what they would do. And jumping over to verse 24, it says there, I will take you out of nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. And verse 25 here it says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. So one of the big things Israel has done is been able to do a lot of irrigation throughout the land and move water down to areas where there naturally isn't water so they can grow food. In verse 30, we're just picking out some, some uh, phrases. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field. And if we jump down to verse 34, the desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. So some pretty amazing little descriptions of what the, the Israelites would be like when they return to that land. They're not just going to sit in the desert and try and survive. They're going to make this place plentiful and they themselves would thrive being there. And uh, it's quite amazing to just look at very brief Google searches and see that these things are happening and Israel isn't just, just surviving, they're actually the world leaders in these things. And just also Ezekiel 38, which many of us know, it talks about when this great northern confederacy comes down, they asked, are you coming to take a spoil? Because... Obviously, the idea is that there is a spoil in Israel to take. And it talks of people dwelling safely, unwalled villages, and that they would have um, cattle and gold and, and goods. There would be a lot of things there to take. And we'll have a look at some of the, the things that are happening in Israel in a few moments. In Luke 21, just to show this isn't just an Old Testament thing as well, is from the Lord Jesus Christ himself was a warning to the people that lived at his time uh, saying what was about to take place only a few years after the Lord was there in Israel. So it was saying so if you see the armies, particularly the Roman armies surrounding the city, it was warning them to get out. And we know that that definitely took place <clears throat> in AD 69 and AD 70 when the Roman armies came through and eventually uh, wiped the place out. But he says there that that from that period of time that Jerusalem itself would be in the control of Gentiles or non-Jews. So the uh, Gentiles would be the ones that are, uh, have control of that land and it would be a certain time in the future where that would be fulfilled or come to, um, come to pass. 
that the Jews would get that back. And we've seen that in 1967 when they took Jerusalem after the Six-Day War. So we see just some little tiny phrases in Scripture can be quite amazing and uh, quite good to look at. So just as a, what would we expect from looking at some of those verses, we would expect to see Israel back in their land, wouldn't we? We'd expect to see them in Israel, as we said, not some other part of the world. Uh, we'd expect to ha- see them in control of Egypt, uh, sorry, Egypt, in the control of Jerusalem. And we see that today. They have, uh, their capital is there in Jerusalem. We'd expect to see them with great wealth and not being the slaves as they were in the past to other nations. And that they would be developing vineyards and fruit and crops and things like that. And dwelling confidently, I think, is a very good word to describe them. So as we mentioned, since the late 1800s, they have been heading back to the land And we've got the two key quotes there of 1948 and 67 of the state of Israel and then the taking of Jerusalem. So we see those things have taken place. So how are they going today? So looking at the same questions that we posed about Egypt, uh, the GDP of Israel is 400 billion, where I think Egypt was um, in the 30s, from the top of my head now. Uh, their GDP per capita is 43,000 compared to Egypt was 3,500. So we see they're very similar to Australia. The people live quite a good life. The population in Egypt, sorry, I'm going to say that quite often, in Israel is about 9 million and um, I believe there's about 8 million or so outside of um, Israel still. Now there's a bit of a difference between when we look at the next uh, few things. What is the biggest company in Israel? is actually a software company. So in Egypt, it was an old telephone business. In Israel, it is a software company worth 18 billion. Uh, The bank is roughly the same size, the biggest bank. Um, I'm certainly not an economist. It's actually quite difficult to pin down how much some of those banks are worth. Uh, But um, 168 billion, which is a pretty big number as well. I was surprised by this next one of what are some of their biggest exports of diamonds was one of the first things listed. I didn't realise Israel actually exported diamonds. But they also do refined petroleum um, citrus, which is a fruit, and gas as well. But one of the biggest things they are actually known for now is their development of software and AI as the next line. So artificial intelligence and what they've developed in that and actually are selling to governments around the world um, is massive. So their RDP, so sorry, their R&D, which is the research and development in technology, is almost 5%. And that's actually one of the highest in the world. It's a significantly higher than Europe as well. So you think if Europe is cutting edge on a lot of things, uh, Israel is far, uh, far more advanced than what they are. And they're actually ahead of the US as well in um, R&D and what they spend per person in the nation. So the actual the amount that US spend would be a lot bigger, but per person it's, it's quite a bit lower, if that makes sense. So one of the interesting things is um, there's a company, if you're interested in cyber security and all that sort of thing, there's a company in Israel which is actually being sued by Apple because they've developed a backdoor into Apple products, so particularly the phones. But the that whole system turns into a political issue because they're backed by the Israeli government. So there's quite a interesting what they have come up with and the intelligence that they have developed there in Israel. And the defence budget there is 20 billion, which is a massive number for such a small nation. It is, that's a, a huge number. But when you think about where they are and what their history of being back in that land is, I think we could all understand why. So the next point there we've got there is Israel is ranked 19th out of 189 countries on the Human Development Index, which is very high. So a lot of the nations that are in front of them, uh, a lot of the northern European nations who live very well, uh, very comfortable uh, lives, Israel is 19th out of that. And so they, whereas Egypt, I think, was um, quite down the other end of that list. So secure and confident, as we said, do they live secure and confident? And no doubt you've heard of Israel's Iron Dome, which defends them against these rockets that get fired 
um, these Iranian-backed uh, rockets uh, from Hezbollah and places like that, and it's rated at 90% accurate, which is a pretty high number when you think there's something flying through the sky at the speed of a missile, and they're able to hit it and uh, blow it up. That's 90% accurate. So what they actually do is they don't shoot every one of them down. They only shoot the ones down that are actually going to land in a populated area. So they can work at the trajectory of the missile and say, that one's just going to land in a paddock. We'll forget about that one. But the other two that are heading towards Tel Aviv will shoot those two down. So since this system's been in place, they've um, intercepted 2,500 uh, missiles, which is pretty staggering, really. So the, the two other points there just show, I think, the confidence of Israel um, where they're testing the other nations. So uh, they're obviously working with the US and using some of the US equipment, but it just shows how confident they are. So they've got a good relationship with Greece, and Greece in the past had bought the Russian um, S-300 air defence system, and so Israel decided let's do some um, work together and do some... Uh, drills or military drills and they asked Greece to turn on this system so we can see what happens and there's obviously nothing really leaked about what, what, the, what the result was um, no one's confirmed or denied what the result was but you can just see Israel saying okay let's turn this Russian system on and we'll see if it even uh, picks up our aeroplanes and in the second uh, point at the bottom there Israel have been using US's new F-35s so they actually came out and said, oh, yes, we've been using these for a little while now, uh, where the US hadn't even told anyone that they had been used. So they've been used over in Syria. And this Major General Amakam said that uh, we've been flying them all over the Middle East, uh, which is a bit of a shock to everyone, thinking we haven't seen them. So Israel have this bravado, or this confidence of, of what they're doing. And this website, NZIV, which is like an Israeli um, news um, site said that this was while Russia was using their latest, that's the S-400 system in Syria and as far as everyone over there was aware that they hadn't picked up these aeroplanes flying over the top of them which you, when you think about a nation living confidently in their little tiny place in Israel uh, they realise that they have this technology advantage over all the nations around them and they certainly do have that confidence there and one of the ways um, I read a while back was one of the ways they can test is if a radar system sends a signal to a boat or an aeroplane, it will respond with some sort of data. They can intercept that and send the wrong data. So the radar says, oh, that's just a commercial flight flying through. Um, or there'll be two planes sitting so close to each other that it only reports one plane. So there's one right above it and it doesn't pick up the second plane, which is some pretty skillful flying if you're in either of those planes. But it just shows that, that confidence that they have. This is a really interesting article uh, from Deloitte. So they're an economic um, consulting business. And this is actually from an Australian point of view. They've gone over to Israel to find out why are you producing so much food in an area that, which is tiny, which would fit in Tasmania. Uh, and they've gone and sent these um, consultants over there and have written a, a document on what Israel is doing. So some of the quotes, it's a um, multi-page PDF. You can, uh, I've got a link at the bottom if you would like it. But it says that Israel provides us with an excellent case study in nationwide innovation. Despite significant political, historical, environmental challenges, it continues to successfully leverage its people and culture in meaningful business success through innovation. So particularly talking about development and growing of food. So they're saying Israel is leading the world in these aspects. And uh, we don't need to go through all of this, but they point out why are they talking to Israel, of all nations in the world, why are they going to Israel for it? And they have a few pages on why Israel is the world leader and cutting edge on those things. As it says in the latter end of that paragraph, while these limitations could cripple the nation, Israel has triumphed in the face of adversity and become the world leader in agri-tech, so technology and agriculture, and consequently an almost entirely food self-sufficient country. If you think of the size of Israel, is pretty surprising, where even Egypt, uh, they actually have to bring in a lot of food, whereas Israel is almost self-sufficient in being able to feed their people. 
And the bottom one as well, uh, the bottom uh, paragraph there, this is a result, this has resulted in Israel becoming a world leaders in desert agriculture. So this is developing food or plants that will grow in uh, low rainfall areas, but also with their irrigation systems and their water technology they've got, and also the desalination uh, technology that they've developed. So you may think of um, sprinklers that drip feed. A lot of that technology has come out of Israel and they're able to work out by only having a tiny drop of water a certain period of time is all the plant needs and the research that they've done. So those, some of those uh, sentences there could be from Ezekiel 36 in what they were doing in the land and developing food in desert places. Uh, as I said in Ezekiel 36, people wouldn't walk through and say, that these are dry places anymore. So it's quite interesting to see, isn't it? So just in uh, conclusion, there's two quotes uh, that I think are, are really interesting. Um, so the one in Habakkuk, which is more talking about the time of Babylon, but where Habakkuk was asked God, when are these things going to happen? Babylon was attacking the, the nation of Israel and God answered Habakkuk and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. So make it blatantly obvious that, even it's, that it's easy to read. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And then later on in that chapter, very, very well-known uh, verse for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So here God was telling Habakkuk that it, from your point of view it may be taking a long time, but it's all in God's plan and his uh, time frame. So hopefully we've been able to see over the last two nights uh, that God is in control of all the things that are happening on this earth. He set out in his scripture uh, what would take place in these empires which from our point of view, we'd look at these empires and they're great, powerful empires that ruled the, the then known world. And as you know, James showed last week, they are just rubble in the, in the sea or covered in sand. And so we see in, tonight, Egypt still exists, yet as a base nation, and yet the people of God are back in their land and they are living confidently and dwelling safely, as uh, pointed out in a number of the prophecies. And the last quote there is, from these things, each of us, hopefully, can have our faith develop. As it says there, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So by seeing these things and being reaffirmed that God is in control, our faith and hope uh, is reaffirmed by them. Thank you. Thanks, Shem. I really do think those prophecies, especially the ones regarding the scattering and regathering of Israel, in the way they're so detailed, so specific, and they have been completed, really do show us that God does exist and he is able to work effectively in the world. Uh, upcoming events. Unfortunately, there's nothing on uh, next Sunday due to the Easter weekend. And so the next uh, Sunday night address is on April the 24th where Dan Bill will be speaking on the true Christian's relationship to politics. And with uh, the federal election being announced this morning, that is quite an uh, appropriate topic to have a consideration of in a fortnight's time. Uh, between now and then, though, there are seminars on uh, Tuesday nights. And Ern's there in the back row. He goes to those. So if you've got any questions about those, uh, have a chat with him if you're interested. Um, and then tonight we've got uh, a light supper to be provided, so grab some food, grab a drink, and stay and have a chat on these amazing uh, Bible prophecies and the confidence that they can give us. So we'll close our night as we started with a prayer, if you'll stand. O oh Lord, our great and our mighty God, we come before you at the close of our night to thank you for this evening that we've been able to spend together around your word. Father, we've seen your word of prophecy, the word that has gone out that clearly shows that 
both that you exist and that you are at work in the world around us. These prophecies are so detailed and so specific and have come to pass exactly as you have said, that it does indeed give us confidence that you exist. And so may these things build our faith, that we may in our lives respond to you and to respond to the call that you have given to us. This time also we're thankful for the supper and for the many other blessings that you give to us. And we ask that we use all these blessings to help us walk on a path that will lead towards your kingdom. We ask this prayer in your son's name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.